Uh, do you all know about the folk theorem of statistical computing? Did I tell you about that one last year? Did I know? <laughs> So um, I love the last talk, by the way. It was, it was very Bayesian, and, and I like that. Um, <laughs> he, you know, it's great when you laugh, but that was serious. Um, <laughs> that, um, so I, I had, he said, uh, we get a solution that's very close. He, wrote, he said, we get a solution that's very close to the one we would like. So I think that means he has some prior information. Um, <laughs> And I think it's great that he's using statistical methods that take advantage of prior information. And you know, I've written about this um, leapfrog phenomenon in statistics, which is that we're all sort of going in the same direction, uh, but different methods leap over themselves, e other methods at different times. Um, I certainly would not say that you should do all of your analysis using Stan or even using Bayesian methods uh, because like individual people are working on individual problems. And so that's one reason I really like that the previous talk was heavily Bayesian and yet not using methods that were nominally Bayesian because it's the principle that's important, right? It's uh, not what church we go to, it's that we all worship the same God, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, the folk theorem of statistical computing, that's when something is, you know what a folk theorem is, right? Do this academic jargon? Like, a folk theorem is something that's true, but you can't quite prove it. Um, as you know, uh, in the previous century, there was a lot of philosophical work, um, Bertrand Russell and, and other people, about how there can be things that are true that can't be proven. So that's folk theorem is like how we talk about it in academia. The folk theorem of statistical computing, I'll get to that, don't worry, don't worry. This isn't actually really part of my talk, but I wanted, I wanted to have some stand to start you off, because I just felt it was, it was appropriate. Um, but yeah, the folk theorem is that if you have problems with your computing, you often, there are often problems with your model. And you can sort of contrapositive that and say that methods that are really blindingly fast are often answering the question that you want to answer, which was the point made in the, in the previous talk. Um, OK, so before the main talk, I just wanted to do a little stand demo. These are old data on uh, success of putts in pro golf. I don't really have any intuition of this. I've never actually played macro golf in my life. and you, um, <laughs> But I was surprised to see that like they only make half of their five foot putts, which is like half, you know, how hard could it be? Five foot five feet's pretty far. It's not so easy. These are pros. Um, and sometimes I give these data to students and I say, fit a curve to these data, you know, maybe predict what's gonna happen at twenty-five feet, uh, fit a model, and this is what they'll typically do. Um, this well, I fit this in Stan, but you, know, you could use other slower tools if, if you really wanted to. Um, well, I don't know. Like, it's not so perfect as a model. For one thing, it, the zero foot putts really probably are gonna go in. Um, even Tiger Woods could probably manage a, a zero foot putt if there were not too many distractions, I suppose. Um, but, well, this was sort of a, this is a two parameter model. Here's a one parameter model. It's like, here's, here's the ball, we know how big the ball is, and here's the hole, we know how big the hole is. The ball goes to the hole. This is a very simple model in which you can't put it too soft or too hard. You just go straight to the hole, and either more than half of the ball is inside the hole and it falls in, or it's not, and it doesn't fall in. And you can figure out the probability that, well, whether the ball goes in is a deterministic function of this angle. And you can, so if we give this angle a normal distribution, which seems reasonable, uh, centered at zero, then the variance or standard deviation of this normal distribution induces a probability of the ball going in as a function of distance. So it's a one parameter model. It's one parameter, sigma. So we can fit that. It's very easy to, to fit in Stan. And here it is, here's the model. Um, in fact, like really, the model is all just these two lines and, and then declarations. Uh, delightfully simple. You just type it in, uh, you don't have to do anything else, and then you get your inference. And there it is, pretty good. Estimated sigma is 
Um, as I said, it's an oversimplified model, but it's actually pretty impressive how uh, one might call a science-based one-parameter model outperforms uh, the two-parameter model that's what we use off the shelf. So that was fun. Um, I should really show you an example where, where we had more challenges with Stan. And so it's actually an inverse problem. This is like such a good follow-up to the previous talk. It's wonderful. Um, this is, if you're a physics student, you've heard about this kind of thing. It's a sum of declining exponentials. And uh, the statistical version is I have a sum of de de declining exponentials with a multiplicative error. I want to estimate A1, B1, A2, and B2. How hard could that possibly be? Well, these predictors are kind of correlated because they're actually just two predictors that are curving down. And it turns out that this is an ill-posed inverse problem. It's the classic ill-posed inverse problem, indeed. It's hard to do. Um, I wanted to play around with that, so I simulated some data from the model and then ran STAN to check that I could recover the true parameter values, plus or minus their uncertainty. Um, here's the model itself, uh, a bunch of declarations, and then here's the model, y is a1 times e to the minus b1x plus a2 times e to the b2x, and then there's a log normal error distribution. So it has uh, five parameters, two a's, two b's, and a sigma put them on a log scale because everything has to be positive, simulated some fake data um, in R. I did that in R. Um, I, I was going to do it in, in SAS, but I thought I would save my money um, for something else. Uh, so I have true parameter values. Uh, the thing you're going to want to focus on are, are B, which are the, co the, exponent, the coefficients. Um, of the exponentials, which are 0.1 and 2. 0.1 and 2 are kind of far apart. They're, ten, they're a factor of 20 apart. So we should be able to distinguish that. Then I simulated um, a bunch of data points, uh, 1,000 data points. Ran Stan. Um, they were supposed to be 0.1 and 2. And there they are. They're 0.1 and 2. With, you know, so it, it worked. Um, then I did it again, but I made the parameters 0.1 and 0.2 which is harder to disentangle. They're only I mean, still a factor of two, but it turns out it's an ill-post inverse problem. This is what happened when we fit the model. Um, you know, geez, you know, actually, it's not so bad. Look, it's, it's inside the interval, because the true value is, is between 0.13 and 1.15 times 10 to the minus 109. So I don't know what you guys are complaining about. It looks just fine to me. Um, it's not. Good, actually. This is, not, this is not the world's worst failure mode, right? I mean, the world's worst failure mode would be a nice, precise estimate of 3.4 or something like that. Um, uh, but I think that we can agree that this uh, is not consistent with our prior information. So I put in priors. Um, now, this is, this is my new favorite prior, um, normal 0, 1. I, I love it. Um, so my. I think there's an analogy to this, and I can't think of it right off the, off the bat. But my, my reasoning for a normal 0, 1 prior, I put normal 0, 1 priors on everything, except for like variance parameters. I give them half normal 0, 1 priors. That's my new, my new universal prior. Um, and my argument for this is that if I really have a parameter that that's not a good prior for, then I really haven't parameterized it well. Um, because I would like all my parameters to be kind of scale-free, right? So I'm not going to be running regressions where I'm regressing GDP and population and you know, getting coefficients like 0 0.002, things like that. Everything should sort of be on the log scale. Um, it's, we got to work. In, we, we know about this in a lot of, I mean, just for example, the paradigmatic examples like you weigh an object on a scale. OK, here you, here you are. You weigh 140 pounds. Like, what's my prior in your weight? Normal 0, 1. Well, that's not, not very good. But really, I shouldn't be putting it on the scale of pounds. That's not, that's scale, not scale free. I should be doing it in terms of, say, I think you're probably between one stan within one standard deviation of the distribution of adult men's weights then it would work out, right? So just for example. So I do this. I just put this in. It's, it's called regularization. I think you heard about it five minutes ago. And here's what happens. It's, it's very nice. Um, 
And um, well, you know, it's supposed to be 0.2, but 0.2 is in there. It really just is a lot of uncertainty here. This is sort of correct, the correct inference, basically. Um, you can't recover it that well. It's an ill posed inverse problem, but we want to be honest about what we do know. So I really like this. I, I, I like this, the, the little twist in the story, and I like that now I can actually solve problems like this. Now, the other, we, we actually do this all the time in, because um, we're doing a lot of work in pharmacometrics. So a lot of when you're studying, when you're modeling what's happening to the drug inside the body because you're doing drug development and you want to set good dosing, then you have a lot of models that look like AE to the minus BX plus CE to the minus DX and so forth. So this is an important problem and it's, it's an insight I didn't have before. Like the, the idea that we should just be always putting things scale free and always giving normal zero one priors on everything. Like I hadn't realized that. It's not really, it's not in our books. And I learned about that because I have this computational ability. So because of R and Stan and I can fit these models, all of a sudden I can do all sorts of things. I can you know, go to the edge of the map and, and go beyond. Um, so again, to echo what happened in the previous talk, it's only that I only showed up 10 minutes ago, otherwise I would be citing all the previous talks today, I think. But, but, but that, like, our computational, the work that, that you all do in this room, like those of you who are developing interfaces or working on statistical software or using software or whatever it is, that's enabling these kinds of statistical insights to come about. Okay, they don't come about in a vacuum. It's not like I'm sitting in my office in Columbia figuring out the right prior distributions and then like people implement it. It's like things get implemented and then I, I can, I can realize what works. Um, so today I wanted to talk about a research project that a colleague and I have been involved in. Um, and I'll start with a story. Uh, this person here is a senator from Ohio. Um, in 1996, he co-sponsored the Defense of Marriage Act, defining marriage as one man and one woman. 1999, voted for a measure prohibiting same-sex couples from adopting children. 2001, openly hostile record on gay rights. Uh, Rob believes, continues to believe that marriage is a sacred bond between one man and one woman. Um, then in 2013, I'm announcing today a change of heart. My son came to Jane, my wife and I, and told us he was gay and it was not a choice. Um, I've come to the conclusion that marriage is something we should allow people to do. Um, and also, uh, Dick Cheney uh, apparently agrees with him on this. <laughs> and um, always a good laugh line, um, at least, at least here in New York City. I didn't come preparing a bunch of like Ted Cruz jokes and Hillary jokes and all that. I, I actually, as a political scientist, I'm, I'm derelict in my duty there. I should tell you, it's, it's funny because. Every, uh, political scientists, every once in a while, we get, I get calls. We, we get calls from like, sort of like third rate, like news organizations sometimes. Like, a, we're the second leading TV station in Chile, and we'd like to interview you, like things, things like that. And, and I don't, like, my Spanish is really bad. It's not like I have any connection to, to Chile either. They're just like looking for somebody. And like, what do you think, you know? Donald Trump, you know, what's up with that? You know, it's like, like, and so I point them to something I wrote in 2011 uh, that I, I published um, saying why primary elections are hard to predict. Because the primary election, the candidates are very similar to each other ideologically. Um, even Bernie and Hillary are really not that different in their, in what they're, they're saying. And that they don't, p voters don't have a party queue, and there are multiple candidates, there's strategic voting, there's electability. There, so there's like six reasons why. And so I'm not gonna try to make any predictions. Not that people shouldn't, but, but so it actually saved me, because probably otherwise I would have said, oh, so-and-so, he doesn't have a chance. But, because I read what I wrote. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm really, 
haven't really been following the election really more than the rest of you. It's funny, like every time a new twist occurs, I'm like all of you guys in the room. I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So it was like first, like Donald Trump, well, he's just a vanity candidate, doesn't have a chance. Then he's doing well in the polls, but that's the polls. When people vote, that's different. Then he won a couple of primaries, and it's like, yeah, but he can't, you know, that's because there are multiple candidates arrayed against him. You know, Wentz, the Santorums all, you know, uh, float away or whatever, then he'll, you know, he'll be remaining and then he'll be fighting just one candidate and he, he won't have a chance and then he was doing well and it's like hey everybody knows Trump is going to be nominated and he, he's unstoppable then well no he's losing now each time I'm with everybody else I'm like yeah you're right um, that makes sense. So, like, if I had been a pundit, I'd be, like, twisting myself into, like, a pretzel like Nate, you know? But as it is, like, I'm, I'm totally off the hook. So, it's, as, you know, as a statistician, it's, it's funny because, like, Bayesian, whatever, we, we can... We, we, one of the problems with the whole Bayesian inference thing is we can give posterior probabilities for everything. And, and it's like, then you can, and, and that's good because you do that and then you force yourself to be out there making mistakes and then you change your model. I mean, that's what it's all about. That's what being a Bayesian is all about is being bold, right? It's all, it's, no, it is. It's all about like pinning your model to the wall. It's, it's, Bayesian is like the ultimate, the original open science, okay? Because you have a, an actual model. Right? Because if you have if you have a method, it's like, oh, I like this method because it has good statistical properties. I like this method because it's fast and somebody programmed. I like this method because the guy who wrote it like really came up with a bunch of other good methods and, and, and that. I like this method because it has lower mean squared error asymptotically. This is fine. So it's all like a matter of taste. But with Bayes, there's no taste involved because I have a model, right? So my model says this is the generating process for the data. I'm making a very strong statement. Then when I'm wrong, you can you can criticize me, so that's good. So with the election thing, I guess maybe I was, if I had been formal about it, I would have said I had very wide uncertainties. Um, and that would have, I guess, been my model. Um, but I, in some way, I wasn't really committing in that way. So the advantage to not committing is that like, I didn't waste a lot of time trying to explain myself. But the disadvantage is that then I didn't have a chance to screw up, right? So somebody like Nate, who keeps screwing up, it's really good because it means he can do better, right? He commits, and then he can do better, which is that that's how you have to move forward. And luckily, he established enough of a re reputation that he can screw up a few times, and, and that's all right. You know, so that's, I'm really happy about that. Um, so... Back to the, this gay marriage thing, um, to what extent, we have this research question, what extent does familiarity with members of a social group influence people's views? Um, that's one of our two questions. Um, and in to, I'll get to the second one in a moment, but I want to introduce the idea of the penumbra. Uh, the, the penumbra is the set of, the penumbra of a group, of a social group, is the set of people who know somebody in that group. So there's some core category like data scientists. And then they, we didn't actually do a survey on that one, but it's a, you're interested in maybe. There are family members, uh, close friends, and then there are acquaintances. So and the nature of the penumbra is that, well, with rare exceptions, it's larger than the core. Um, and we talk of the size and shape of the penumbra. And the size is, of course, how many people know a data scientist, how many people know a gay person, whatever. The, the shape of the penumbra is how close are the people. So you could have some penumbras where almost everybody who knows somebody is in the family of that group, other or very close friends, other penumbras which are full of more distant people. Um, and the political puzzle, the thing we're interested in is it's not so much the individual level. It's not so much that we're trying to explain why is it that somebody changes their mind about gay marriage or, or whatever, but rather how is it that a group such as gay people, which is 3% of the population, can seemingly have such um, influence? Um, and of course, there are other groups that are 3% of the population, 2% of the population that do or don't have influence. And there's a lot of discussion about this. These, these things come up, teacher unions or nurses, police officers, minority religious groups, minority ethnic groups. 
Um, we tend to talk about these in a very simplistic way, like voters. You know, like how do people of group X vote? Not always. Sometimes we realize when there's a teacher strike, there's all this about like who's sympathetic to teachers, right? So the, that's sort of about the penumbra. A lot of it is, well, my kids are in school. I, I, I know their teachers, so that's a plus. On the other hand, I was a kid and I knew my teachers then. That's a minus. So it's, it's a balance, right? Always, always some to think about that. We all hated our teachers when we were kids, I think. At least, at least I did. Um, <laughs> So these are our two questions. One is at the individual level, and the other is the idea that the social penumbra can explain preferences, help us understand preferences. Um, and again, it, um, ex example of the political relevance of this, again, to use uh, gay marriage as an example, not long ago, gay marriage was being used as a wedge issue by conservatives. They put it on the ballot in order to get their followers all riled up. Now, more recently, conservatives are sort of irritated about the issue, and they say, how come you liberals want to politicize gay marriage and keep bringing it up? So it's, it's changed to the extent um, I, well, I already said it. Okay. So we did a survey. Um, we did, well, it was two surveys. There's a panel study. So we, we interviewed or we, we paid some people to interview 3,000 respondents. Um, then they re-interviewed. I, I have a great graph that I made. I'm not, I'm not, I don't actually have it right at my fingertips, which shows the uh, percentage of people who res um, responded to the second wave as a function of age. It's very striking. The older you are, the more likely you are to respond to the second wave. But it's like, so it's like linear. Like the probability, if you're 18, the probability you respond to the second wave is like zero. And if you're 90 years old, it's like, it's like 100%. It's like just linear. It's sort of very striking. So there are some statistical issues having to do with you know, how to weight or adjust that. We've, we've um, pretty much ignored those issues, except we've done like, well, we did it two ways. We did it weighted and not weighted. It didn't really matter much, like, like that. Probably we should think more about it. I doubt we're getting the most out of our data. I mean, to say we're not getting the most out of our data is, is like the understatement of, of the I don't know, the week at the very least, because we, we actually put questions on like five other surveys that we really haven't even gotten around to analyzing yet, because it's like not clear what to do with them. So I think, I think you can all relate to this, that you have data that are relevant to your question, but they're not exactly what you want. So instead of using the existing data, which are obviously relevant, you gather new data that are just what you want. Then it turns out the new data aren't quite just what you want either. And then you have to gather another survey. And, and so we're not doing the best there. I, I, I keep thinking that we, we, we should do better, um, like that somehow someone could just dive into all these data and find interesting things. It's hard to dive into data and find interesting things, though. You really need to know what you're looking for. Um, we asked about membership. So we, in our survey, we asked people questions like, how many people do you know? How many gay people do you know? How many recent immigrants do you know? Im Americans who, who, were, who, who came from other countries within the last five years. How many women do you know who've had an abortion in the past five years? A bunch of questions like that. How many people do you know who are recently unemployed? No. Uh, we threw that in because we felt there's a potential natural experiment because when we designed the study, we thought, who knows what's going to happen in the next year in the economy. Maybe we'll have another you know, recession. Unfortunately, we didn't get that. Um, but you know, we, 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 we put our marker down and on, you know, red and black came up, you know, whatever. Um, we also asked um, name membership. So we asked people, how many people do you know named a bunch of different names? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, show you those, too. Uh, and then we asked related attitude questions, attitudes on immigration, gay marriage, airport screening, unemployment insurance, uh, health care reform, um, which were related to the penumbras. As I said, we actually have other questions in the general social survey that I don't really know what to do with that ask similar questions. Um, here's what we found. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about well, I'll tell you what this graph is. Um, these are the size and shapes of the penumbra. And then I'll tell you about like, like issues about the graph. Um, these are the groups. Um, in each group, the red is the size of the core group, which is not from our survey. It's from Wikipedia. Like I looked up how many Americans are in the active military or whatever. 
um, they're ordered in increasing size of the group. So the largest group are people with serious health problems. It's about 25% of the population, because it's area scaling. Uh, people who receive welfare, it's not clear even what that means. It's not like, do I receive government welfare because I have NSF grants? Um, you know, it's not, <laughs> not, completely, not completely obvious. Um, the three, the light gray represents the entire population of US adults, and the intermediate ones represent the penumbra, the percentage of people who know at least one, per, at least one family member in the group, at least one family member or at least one close, or close family member or close friend, and at least one person, period. So military has a big penumbra compared to the size, which I suspect is a sort of definitional thing that I think there's a lot of people who think they know someone in the active military, but the person's in the reserves or no longer active. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but still, it's a big penumbra. Um, immigrant is a much smaller penumbra, which makes sense. Um, presumably, a lot of immigrants are, are keeping to themselves more. Um, there's the National Rifle Association. This is famous for people overestimating. Like, you think you know someone in the National Rifle Association, but they're not. Like, they once were members, or they got the sticker, or, 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 or whatever. Um, um, abortion, uh, very interesting that, well, it's not known exactly how many um, have, ha have had abortions. Um, the penumbra is quite small, uh, presumably not because nobody knows someone who has an abortion, but rather because people don't talk about it so much. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's much more observable if somebody lost their job. Uh, there could be classification issues there, too. Uh, Muslim is, these two are interesting because they're about the same number of Muslims and gays, yet the gay penumbra is much bigger than the Muslim penumbra. Now, I've been talking to my colleague in the physics department, and we've decided to pool our resources and actually devote all of our research effort into building a time machine, uh, because I then want to go back and, and ask this question in previous years and, and see the penumbra growing. Um, uh, and then you can see you can see some of the others. Um, this was sort of an interesting one. Um, do you uh, do you care for an elderly? This is, if, these are. Do you know anyone who's a caregiver for an elderly person? Uh, there are a lot of people who are caregivers. The penumbra is relatively small. Um, perhaps people aren't fully aware of it, or, or maybe the people who are caregiving are not actually don't know a lot of people. It, it's hard to disentangle these things. Um, we, uh, these are names, so we did something similar. How many people do you know name Walter, Rose, Bruce, Tina, Kyle, Emily, Jose, Maria? Um, here we have the size of the group and the number of people known, period. We didn't break it up. For this survey, we didn't ask how many. Oh, I made these graphs in, in R, actually. I, I, used, <laughs> I used base graphics. I'm sorry. It's just like, I don't know. Um, the, you don't want to ask how many close family members do you know named Kyle because the numbers are so small. So the point is, actually, if you're asking something that's less than 1% of the population, like one of these names, you can just say, how many people do you know? But if it's a big group, I'm not going to ask you how many Democrats do you know, how many Republicans do you know, because you can't think of all of them in, in your head. Um, so that's so for those other groups, we asked more. Now, I wanted to maybe sort of dish on this graph and say how horrible it is because it's sort of bad in so many ways. It, it violates a lot of principles. If this were, I was going to say if this were made by anybody but me, I would really criticize it. But, but I made it, and I'm criticizing it. So even I would, would do that. I think there are some good things about it. I like how it's self-contained. I like the, the descriptive heading. Um, the, maybe the heading should have been a footnote, and I should have had a more descriptive. Uh, sentence title. I think the real thing that you're sort of perhaps worried about or wondering is this, is this area representation. Because we're always we're told never to use the area representation. In fact, when I'm reading it, I'm literally taking square roots in my head. I'm like, hmm, this looks like it's about a tenth. So I guess that must be point one, you know, and so forth. I shouldn't be doing that. 
So I'll just tell you a story. I started as making them as actual bullseyes because I wanted to give that like penumbra feeling. So with the bullseyes, the trouble is they all just look like bullseyes. So I slice them in quarters and then you could see what's going on. So that was a little trick that, that happened to work. I didn't do it to save space. I'm not some sort of like tufty type guy, like, oh yeah, wasting too much ink, you know, whatever. Like, <laughs> you know, it's not that. It's just somehow it seemed to convey, it seemed to fit, you know. But you know, I shouldn't do this, right? Like, so first, it seems wrong. Um, the second thing is this particular grid doesn't allow me to easily compare different things. So it seems like what I should really do is list the 14 groups and then have a little bar chart or dot chart shading. Why not do that? And I guess to me, it was just so important to convey the feeling of the penumbra that I did this. And, and so I, I violated certain statistical graphics principles in order to satisfy a data visualization principle. The data visualization principle I'm talking about is sometimes called the principle of similarity, which is that what you display should be sort of related to what the concept you're trying to convey. The scatter plots don't really display the similarity principle because the point on the scatter plot is the value of x and the value of y, which is nothing. Now, by the way, those, those network graphs that we often like to laugh at, you know, with the dots connected with nodes and, you know, all the nodes connected with edges and all that, they do actually satisfy the similarity principle because, like, you think of people as being sort of physically in some space. Like, they're hanging around each other. They're a network. So that, that works. So anyway, I, I kept the similarity principle even though it violated certain other things. So I, I just wanted to be a little bit open about that. Um, so I don't have... Let me actually... Um, pause um, and say that this example, like it's full of R stuff, you know, which is fun, um, but I don't have like a big powerful conclusion. It's not like last year I talked about the Xbox and we were like, we kicked ass, you know. Here it's like we're doing this thing, it's interesting. I, I just wanted to give you a little feeling for like how we're doing research. So I, I maybe, I, it's, it's an important project and sometimes it's good to see things that are in the middle. Um, or maybe dead ends, you know, who knows? Um, we, we fit a hierarchical regression model um, in, in STAN um, for each survey response. We just actually, in this case, we just took it like the survey responses, do you know any people in, in each of these categories? And we included um, states as predictors. So what we're actually estimating is the relative prevalence of people who know person X, um, a, a person of type X, in different states. And the color scheme, it's, it's a bi-directional color scheme where blue is high and um, where, yeah, um, a bi-directional color scheme where blue is high and orange is, is low. And we computed the estimated standard deviation of the probability of knowing somebody, um, or maybe it was, yeah, uh, uh, across states. And you see, like, um, this relate to the shape of the penumbra. So at the top, knowing mortgage underwater, gun owners, gay and lesbians, these are somewhat variable by states, meaning that there's some geographic structure to these penumbras on the top. They're in decreasing order. As we go down, though, the color, the maps become grayer and grayer, indicating that there's very little geographic variation and until we have serious health problem in abortion where there, there's very little at all. Now, I don't think there is zero variation. Like, presumably, like, doesn't Florida have a lot of old people? Maybe they have more people with serious health problem. There are probably certain things going on. The, but the point is that um, the, these penumbra, they're, they're, these penumbras do not have strong geographic structure, which seems like it could be politically relevant. But I can't say that I've taken this and plugged it into a political science analysis and I have an answer, but it seems like the kind of thing that one should look at. Um, this also illustrates a little bit the synergy. I feel bad because I haven't had any jokes in a couple minutes. Um, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. While I'm talking, I'll try to parallel track my brain and come up with some funny lines. Um, but this is serious, that serious statistical point. I'm trying to talk about the inter interaction between these different things. There's data collection, handling the data, munging, all that. 
Um, also, well, we actually fit a hierarchical model. Um, but usually, like, I think often it's set up like, blah, 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 blah. Now we fit the big model, and it's the big model. And now here's our estimate, and here's beta, and here's our confidence interval, and that's it. And then here's some graphs showing how cool we are, OK? But here, it's like the model we're fitting is like a little tool, right? Like we're fitting the model to learn a little bit about the data. Then we want to learn something else, we fit another model. So I don't want you to think of models as culminations. I want you to think of modeling as cheap. Modeling has become cheap now, OK? And so, you know, we don't, you just like, we just do a model because we want to learn something, right? So if I want to see the variation by state, because I want to understand the geographic pattern of the penumbra, what do I do? Do I compute the mean within each state, then take a weighted difference, and then correct for the sampling standard deviation, and then you know do a principal component, and blah, 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 blah? No, I fit a model. But it's not be, because fitting a model is how I analyze data, how I answer little questions. It's not the culmination. And similarly with the graphs. I'm able to make these graphs, so I make the graphs, and, and, and they help out. You know? Um, by comparison, I, we did the same penumbra analysis, no, sorry, the same geographic analysis with a bunch of non-penumbra questions. So are you a conservative? Or do you attend church regularly? These things are about as variable. So if I go back, things like do you know anyone with an underwater mortgage? Do you know any gun owners? Those are about as geographically correlated concentrated as, are you a conservative? Do you attend church regularly? So it's not nothing, right? There is, some, there is something going on there. With names, there's very little of anything. Rose, Emily, Walter. Um, by the way, we chose these names, Rose, Emily, Walter, Bruce. To Names have age profiles. There is no name with a uniform age profile. Um, if there are any Lindas in the room, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And Rose and Walter are like old people. And, 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 and I can't remember which, you know, but like Kyle is a young name. Like, so Emily and Kyle, I think, are young. And Tina and Bruce are middle-aged. So, so you, you sort of, that way when you add them up, you get something that's roughly uniform, not, not exactly. Now, Maria and Jose are, are more geographically concentrated, unsurprisingly, Jose more than Maria, which also makes sense if you think about who's named Maria and who's named Jose. Um, we can look at, we looked at more things. I wanted to understand the penumbras. Who's in the penumbra? So for each group, we, we computed the mean survey response, the average number of people known in the group, average number of close family, close friends, or other known in each group among survey respondents who categorized themselves as Democrats, Independents, and Republicans. And it's what you would expect. Um, although, I don't know if I would have expected the magnitude or lack of magnitude of the things. Very, not much difference in serious health problem. But if you look, Republicans seem to know more people in the military and more NRA members. Uh, Democrats and independents are more likely to know immigrants, Muslims, gay people, um, and so forth. Uh, of course, Democrats, independents are more likely to know people with no health insurance. I'm more likely to know. Um, uh, but you know, I think we, we see a bit of variability here. Um, I wouldn't know how to interpret this. Um, I could put standard errors on all these things, but I almost don't need to, because I, I'd rather point to things and say they don't all make sense, which sort of gives us an indication of how much we should trust these, these numbers. It's good when you have a graph to have a measure of internal variability, right? So like, it's like when someone talks, you want him to, to, to lie every now and then and to catch him on it, because then you'll, you'll know, like, while well, he lies occasionally, you'll sort of calibrate things a little bit. And similarly here, like, I like my data to look a little bit rough. I don't like it to look too made up. You know, I want to see my data the way they get up in the morning before they have a chance to <laughs> put on their face. Hmm? Um, I have more to say, but you know what I don't really have more is time. Um, and so let me stop here because there's just more of this um, data analysis. Um, I think you've really gotten the picture. Um, it, it's always a pleasure to speak here. And I just think it's wonderful what Jared has done to organize this, this whole community. This is something that did not exist 30 years ago, you know, when, when, when I was younger. and it's. I think it's very exciting um, 
and I, I'm really, it makes me very happy to be able to contribute in any way to this. So have a wonderful afternoon.